okay, you're gonna learn something then. All right. It's all yours. <laughs> Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Jim Cowart, and uh, it's nice to have you all come visit us. Uh, as Bruce mentioned, throttle transients are especially challenging. In fact, I spent most of the 90s at Ford Motor Company, and I would say about 90% of my time in engine calibration. Uh, I've got probably a couple million cars on the road with my calibration. Uh, a special version of the Taurus, a flex fuel Taurus that runs on alcohol as well as uh, Lincoln Continental. And uh, the biggest challenge was throttle transit. So I have actually uh, 12 minutes. I'll try to let you know what I've worked on for the last two decades in 12 minutes. Um, and it's, uh, let me give you first a little background. I always like the history of, of why we uh, have an issue and, and, and why we need to study it. And uh, let's go back uh, a century. This, of course, is the Model T. Uh, having worked at Ford, I was always a huge Ford fan. I uh, hope to get a Model T someday. It has a very simple carburetor. It was actually called the Iron Pot. Probably not good marketing today, but uh, back then <laughs> it must have been effective. Uh, Holly, of course, still a famous company in the carburetor business. It was actually two brothers that started the company in 1899. Uh, they were very successful. Uh, they started selling them to General Motors, which wasn't GM at the time. It was Oldsmobile. Uh, as one of the companies, and then to Henry Ford starting in 1904. Uh, they, they sold millions of them on the Model T. This is a mid-teens Model T. And it just used a really simple approach. Uh, what we have here is a carburetor with a Venturi. And the beauty of it is that it's, it, it, if, as you increase the airflow, it automatically adds more fuel. Uh, and it does that by, as the engine draws more air, we get a higher velocity through the of the Venturi, and then that creates a, a greater pressure drop, pulling more, sucking more fuel in from the bowl of the engine. Very simple. If you double the airflow, you double the fuel flow. So that was nice. However, these were very slow accelerating vehicles. <laughs> Top speed, maybe 25 miles an hour, and getting there wasn't as important as it is, uh, at least reflected in car driving today. So um, pretty simple approach. Things started to change, though, in the 50s. Uh, a number of years ago, I talked with the historian at Hawley. And uh, having worked on transient fuel, really the accelerator pump problem, uh, I was interested in when they started putting accelerator pumps onto carburetors. Uh, he wasn't exactly sure, but he was pretty sure it was the late 40s, early 50s. And that's really post-World War II when, when, when people wanted more performance out of their vehicle. So uh, what happened in the 50s was we, we had our carburetor here in cross-section. Here's the Venturi, uh, same effect here. We get a fuel bowl uh, providing fuel uh, into this low pressure zone. That also helps the fuel vaporize, which is a nice feature. And again, as you open up that throttle, say double the airflow, you'll automatically double the fuel flow. But you're doubling it here. You still have some plumbing tubing down to the engine, and that's really where the problem is. Arise. So what uh, everyone started doing in the 50s was having an accelerator pump on their carburetor. Many of you that have worked on carbs may have, have cranked the, the throttle with the air cleaner off and you look for a little shot of fuel, uh, especially if it's not accelerating and it's bogging down on the, uh, as Bruce mentioned. Well, it's a pretty simple device. Here's the throttle plate. You have a cable that generally uh, goes to your, uh, your throttle pedal. And uh, when that throttle is opened by your foot pedal, uh, this extra linkage pushes this pump lever, pivots here, and it just pushes this little pump here. It sends more fuel in when you accelerate. So they know you needed to do this. It really wasn't understood well as to why at the time. Uh, this is from a General Motors paper in 1960, and it shows what they did with, with the accelerator pump. Uh, this shows the pounds of uh, air over pounds of uh, fuel. We call that the air-fuel ratio today. Uh, but uh, air to fuel, most of you know that 14.5 on a mass basis is uh, the, the, the chemical stoichiometry. We like about 14 and a half pounds of air to one pound of fuel. Uh, if 
we're at numbers greater than that, to the air fuel ratio, that means we have more air, we're, we're fueling numbers less than 1425, of course, fuel rich. Well, what uh, Gia did is, here's the airflow, idle was somewhere about here, and uh, when they were cruising, you can see they were cruising at about 14 to 1. It's about 5% rich. Remember, gasoline was 25 cents a gallon. Everybody ran a little rich because it's actually the engine's more stable that way. And uh, however, what I've shown here in General Motors A, B, C, D, I've kind of stunned it by this. This is the loop uh, in, in air fuel ratio they delivered during a, a, a throttle opening. It went to about uh, 12 to 1 almost uh, while you accelerate. And then when you get out of the throttle, you're, or, or you hold the throttle at your cruise condition, uh, your throttle's fixed. You're not pumping any extra fuel, so you, you drift back to your 14 to 1. So this was done for decades, decades. And it was really the emissions legislation of the, the mid to late 60s that led us to, to try to understand why. And really, uh, real briefly, as you have this fuel here, it's often some uh, large particles, you could say. And as it travels down into the engine, some of that fuel sticks on these metal surfaces. So it's delayed. We call it fuel puddles or wall wetting. And uh, it's delayed on going in. And, and really, that's the problem. That's why we have to add extra fuel to keep what's, what's going into the engine at about the air fuel ratio we want. Uh, when I got to Ford in 1990, carburetors were just being phased out. We could not control them tight enough uh, to get emissions where they needed to be. And so uh, port fuel injection, well, was preceded by central fuel injection, one like big, big injector in place of the carburetor. And it was really in the mid-'80s that a former colleague of mine, almost a, a mentor at Ford Research, uh, his name was Charlie Aquino, he really uh, popularized and I think really invented the XCal model that I'll briefly mention here. Um, this is a nice summary for port fuel injection. Uh, what's going on with throttle transients? There's quite a bit here. Let me run through real quick. Uh, this is from Professor Shaler in England. And uh, what he did is an engine startup. Started it up here at zero time and ran for about 10 minutes. And um, Every 30 seconds or so, did a throttle opening, held it like an acceleration event, and then back out and cruise, and then another opening. Um, and so you can see throttle position right here, about a dozen or so throttle openings. Uh, the top line is engine coolant temperature, and uh, I've taken about 10 minutes to warm up. So what's going on? If we look at the air-fuel ratio, I think many of you know we can measure that in the exhaust with some, some fairly simple sensors. Um, Prof. Shaler was commanding a, an air fuel ratio of 12 to 1. It's a little richer than stoic, but the engine was warming up, so it's a little safer place to be. So ideally, I added this red line across here. The air fuel ratio, if we double the air, we should double the fuel. Uh, and then cut the air in half, should cut the fuel in half. Uh, most Fuel control systems can do that. And that's what was done here. However, what we'll see is that when you open the throttle, we go to air fuel ratios that are quite lean. And when we close it, we go rich. So we go lean because fuel's delayed in all these walls of the intake system. And we go rich because when you close the throttle, you get really low pressures absolute in the intake system. Fuel vaporizes, and it just gets drawn into the so we're far from ideal here. In fact, you're really almost into the stumble region here. Once you start to warm up, these kind of excursions just lead to, to that bogging down, that, uh, that uh, hesitation we call it. Let's just zoom in on one here. Again, we're trying, we're commanding actually, this looks like about 11 to 1. But if we, if we look here, if we double the air and double the fuel flow, this is port fuel injected computer control. Double both. Ideally, that air fuel ratio stays constant. Ideally. However, without any compensation, uh, we're going to go lean here. As we tip in and accelerate, we're going to go rich on the back out. So that's what we have to compensate for if we really want crisp uh, and nice acceleration. Uh, this is Matic by Toyota. That's 
called wall wetting or fuel puddles. And today we actually shoot the injector right at the intake valve. Uh, we want to get the fuel as close to the combustion chamber as possible. We also do it because the intake valve warms up the quickest in an engine start, and therefore we get the best vaporization for the lowest emission, uh, uh, as well as the best transit response because the fuel is as close to the combustion chamber as possible. Uh, but they nicely depict here these little fuel puddles, these films of liquid fuel. And, and at first, before I started working on this problem, I was, I was like, why is this happening? The engine's hot, right? Why? Why do we have liquid puddles of fuel? And uh, I just put up, this is a distillation curve of a, of a representative gasoline. It's actually a summer blend uh, with a vapor pressure of about 7 psi. Uh, but what's shown here is fuel temperature. And gasoline really boils from about 30 degrees uh, centigrade, just above room temperature, uh, up to about 200 degrees C. So we got hundreds of fuel components in that range. And uh, if you look at most intake, cylinder heads run about 110 degrees centigrade, roughly. There's gradients. But if you shoot over here, only about 50% is evaporated in this distillation experiment. So uh, it's really these heavy ends that boil at much higher temperatures that are content to be liquid in a hot, stabilized engine. What's interesting, if you look at the effect of pressure, of course, as we go to lower pressure, close the throttle, that makes things want to vaporize much more easily. And, um, and so when we close the throttle, uh, that helps fuel vaporization. Just a little more data. There's been some very nice studies that actually have uh, uh, high-speed cameras, some laser diagnostics. Uh, we're, we're all pretty certain there are liquid puddles. <laughs> And uh, uh, one of the seminal studies about 10 years ago, Toyota, they actually had, here's an intake uh, a manifold, intake port, intake valve, spark plug. And uh, they had an electromagnetic valve here that they could stop at any cycle during the startup. And uh, they did startups and transients. And then whenever they stopped the intake valve, they'd actually close this butterfly valve here. This isn't the throttle. They wanted to seal off the intake and then they were able to, with some sampling systems here, uh, uh, pull out and measure the size of the puddle. And it was actually a lot bigger uh, than I think a lot of us thought. This shows the amount of the puddle uh, as a function of basically throttle position, increasing throttle position, increasing engine output. And both inside the engine, when I was at MIT, as a grad student, we saw this. We had a, uh, an engine with quartz glass walls, and when the engine's cold, it's unbelievable. You'll see these liquid films uh, inside the engine. The flame will go by, and those liquid puddles will stay there because the walls are so cool. So to give you kind of an order of magnitude, most engines uh, uh, require about 30 milligrams of fuel for a, a wide open event. So inside the engine, and this is cold, uh, it's just about 30 degrees C, about 10 degrees over room temperature startup. About one injection worth of fuel, just happily content residing inside the engine. Uh, in the port, much more. It could be five, six times uh, what you need for one combustion event. It's just residing in there uh, in the puddle. So quite a bit. Uh, so what are the challenges? Uh, actually, a lot. Uh, I won't have time to go into all this, uh, but uh, generally what we do is we try to get good fuel to air matching steady state. As Bruce mentioned, uh, with, a, with a little bit of dyno time, you can generally achieve that. Uh, slight variations in volumetric efficiency as a result of camshafts and, and, and such. But uh, once you get that base steady state fuel control, you need to work on some, some transient fuel. Um, one of the challenges, of course, is computational delays. Uh, the information you get from a sensor uh, always has to be a little earlier than when you inject. So how, how do we manage that? And at Ford, we try to anticipate changes uh, based on uh, the previous few cycles. Uh, this is uh, tricky, but the manifolds have to empty and fill. They have to change pressure as we open and close the throttle. Uh, as Bruce mentioned, speed density is easier in this regard because we're actually measuring the pressure in the intake. 
which is pretty close to what ultimately goes into the engine. Uh, probably the biggest challenge, I'm working with Commander Hamilton on this, it's very cold engines. Uh, this is the hardest part. If you start up your engine, at Ford, we had a couple percent of the population that could start their engine, get it into gear, and accelerate in less than five seconds. This gives the lawyers hives, and they keep on us as engineers not to make sure any stall uh, could possibly occur. <laughs> and uh, so cold engines are tough. If you can let your engine warm up a couple minutes, uh, then transit fuel control is a lot easier. Uh, different measurement techniques, wide range O2 sensors uh, are getting cheaper. Uh, however, they're pretty slow. So you got to do your transients on about a one second time scale in order to uh, get some good data. Another thing to keep in mind, most people don't realize, but the uh, seasonal variations in fuel uh, can, can, can swing dramatically from about uh, uh, less than 7 PSI vapor pressure in the summer to 13 PSI vapor pressure in the, uh, in the winter. So when you set up your fuel control, Seasonal variations can, can affect that. Uh, real quick, XTAL model. Uh, if we look at, say, doubling the air and fuel flow, and uh, we model the, pu the puddle mass in the intake as increasing, uh, what we can generate is a predicted uh, response in lambda, which is the relative air fuel ratio. When we go to numbers bigger than one, that's lean. Uh, we can predict. That curve, which looks just like, sorry, this one, right? So if you look at this one, this is leaner. Uh, we can predict it with a really simple model. And it's, it's right here. This equation, they're both related just by conservation of mass. But basically, we track the change in the puddle mass, the liquid puddle in the intake, by two terms. X is the fraction of the fuel that you inject on that cycle that goes into the puddle. And then we subtract out this term that's related to the puddle mass and a time constant. So if we can find what x and tau are, then we'll get good compensation. This, this works in the industry really well. Uh, here's a couple other uh, uh, model predictions with x and tau active. Uh, once an engine's warmed up, a lot of production engines, about 30%, x equals 0.3, 30% of what you inject goes into the puddle. Uh, and it comes out at a time scale of about 24, a less, little less than half a second. And uh, what we show here is if you look at the, the, the purple line, this is, uh, say, the doubling of, of air and fuel when the throttle open. But what we have to inject is quite a bit more. And if you use that simple order, first order model, uh, as shown here, the puddle mass increasing uh, with the first order behavior, got to over-inject just to keep what's going into the engine at the right air I spent a few years at MIT looking at throttle rates. At Ford, we thought that was an effect. Uh, this is a slow one-second throttle opening. This is a real quick one. Uh, and actually, the XTAL model looks great no matter what the throttle rate. Oh, busy chart, and I'm running out of time. A lot of variables. We've got X, that fraction of what you inject that goes into the puddle during the transient. Uh, depending on what the engine load is and where you change to, what the engine coolant temperature is, what's the RPM, and what's the read vapor pressure, what's this, is it winter fuel or summer fuel? Um, really, I've highlighted the two big columns. X is most dominantly a function of engine coolant temperature. So again, if you can let your engines warm up, before you start stomping on the throttle, it'll be a lot easier to manage. I spent a lot of my time just trying to get this to work well in the first 10, 20, 30 seconds after engine start, that's, that's really tough. Uh, tau, a uh, strong function of speed, as you can imagine. The faster the engine's going, the more it strips those liquid puddles into the engine, and it will drop rapidly with uh, increasing engine speed. All right, finally, here's just some uh, of my Ford data. Two liter ZTEC, uh, which was replaced by the two liter PZEV, uh, but this was out in a, uh, middle 90s to, to a few years ago. And uh, you have a fast throttle opening. These are the toughest, very aggressive drivers. And uh, you see charge air there on the top doubling. Uh, and if we have injected fuel, uh, you can see that's the solid black circles. 
and uh, we don't compensate for any extra fuel delays in the intake, uh, what happens is the in-cylinder, I had a very fast diagnostic right inside the engine, and you go quite lean, lambda's greater than one, for many engine cycles, and that's the stumble that, that none of us want. Um, however, if we add in that extra fuel, that's the black dots here, you throw in a lot more for a few cycles. Uh, this is quite a bit better, but um, it's not perfect. <laughs> I think you'd be surprised if you looked at most of your production cars today, it's still a challenge uh, to get it right. And this is what was in production at Ford. Uh, we actually looked at how we could improve even upon that. All right. A few minutes over, but uh, it's these puddles, puddles in the intakes. This fuel delays, relatively, uh, even though the engine's hot, it's still cool in some regards with regards to those heavier fuel components. Um, and those puddles change when we open the throttle, those puddles get bigger. We need to account for that. And uh, uh, so if we model that puddle path, the change in it as a first order system works great. We have to find those X and tau empirically. And, uh, and once you do, you generally get nice accents. Uh, I'll skip that. Any comments or questions? That's a lot in 20 minutes. <laughs> James.